with us this morning, and let's sing this verse together. To Thee, Great One and Three. To Thee, Great One. and we worship him, we praise him, and he's the only one who deserves the glory. Well, as we continue to worship this morning, aren't you thankful that we have a friend in Jesus, the friend who is, sticks closer than a brother? There is nobody like Jesus. Amen? Let's worship him and praise him. Lift him up and glorify our Jesus. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases, no, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles, he will guide. As a gift to us, he will be the example of love, and we need to shine that love and that gift to all around us. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one, no, not one. Will he refuse us a home in heaven? No, not one.
us to trust in Jesus, to trust him alone. And when we trust him, when we live in obedience to him, he proves himself faithful. Amen? Does he prove himself faithful in your life? He does day after day, over and over again. Well, thank God we have the word of God, the infallible word of God that tells us every time how to follow him. But we have to listen. So when we open the word of God, what happens? God speaks. God speaks. He speaks. But we need to have hearts that listen to him, that bow before him, even before he speaks and say, God, whatever you say, I will do it. Whatever you say, I will do it. Make that your heart this morning as we read his word together. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. We place others before ourselves just as Christ did. He's the example. Can we do it in ourselves? No, we cannot. His spirit must be on us and in us in order to live like that. But you know, God is a God who is mighty and in all circumstances in our lives, even in disasters, in personal disasters, in public disasters, he is always on the throne. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Let's continue to worship and to praise him. A man is going to lead out on this verse and then we'll follow. Let's praise our almighty God. He is God alone. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. Let's sing together. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is.
That's what you are. You are God alone, looking for a time to get. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad. his throne the earth is his footstool we come before an awesome holy God none like him that we gather and worship and praise today thanking him for his great love that he's shown us in Christ Jesus and realizing each day that he is there present ever waiting for you and I to call on him and that's what we do right now in the midst of our service we've praised him in song but now we pray to him and say God we need you we depend upon you and as we're praying this morning we're praising him for just the response of God's own peoples pouring out into uh, that area of western North Carolina and ministering to those in need such an encouragement to my heart I hope it is to yours as well let's see God's people actively engaged in responding to those in desperate need not just needing help but needing hope and we know where that hope is found it's in Jesus Christ and so I want you to pray for our brothers and sisters and those to the west of us also for those in Florida Georgia South Carolina we also want to pray for our elections that are coming up in less than 30 days. I don't know about you, but I want God-fearing leaders. And so let's pray for that to happen. And let's do our part in that as well. But let's ask God to give us better than we deserve. We're also praying for Mark Carter, Bud Redman, Tony Smith, Elaine Pierman. Pray for these brothers that need God's healing touch. And just lift them up before the Lord this morning. Maybe you have a burden as well. Let's bring it. Let's lay it on the altar. Let's pray to the Lord who is in control. He's unstoppable. Nothing can stop him from doing his will. And that includes in your life and my life. And so let's ask for that today. God, do your will in my life. Let me be yielded to what you want to do in me and through me as we spread and share the gospel with the world around us. Let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank you that we can stop in the middle of praising you and pray to you and call on you. Acknowledge, Lord, we depend on you. There is none like you. You are upon your throne. Lord, you're, we can be still and know that you're God because of that, Lord. To know you will be exalted. You will receive glory in the earth. God, as we come today, we, we lift up those who have experienced great loss in the past couple of weeks, Lord. And some who've lost their livelihoods. Some who've lost possessions. Some have lost loved ones, God. And we ask that you continue to bring comfort and healing and grace and mercy into their lives. Thank you, Father, for your people, the church, the body of Christ, being the hands and feet of Jesus, Lord, bringing help and hope, Lord. And I pray we continue to do that. I'm so thankful for our church family, God, and our response, Lord. And I'm thankful for the willingness of your people, Lord, uh, to be vessels of mercy, Lord, to be instruments of kindness, Lord, to go forth and, and Lord, minister to those who are hurting. And Father, I thank you for the doors of opportunity you've given us in that, not just to bring material help and hope, but spiritual help and hope in Jesus. And help us to be faithful with that. God, in, in less than 30 days, we're going to have new leaders voted on and elected in our prayer right now, Father, we, we, we ask you, please give us those who fear you.
Please give us those who know what is right and wrong as you define it. Please give us those that will do what is right in that position of authority that you give them. God, to to reward those who live righteously and godly. Lord, to to take uh, prosecute those who do wickedness and evil. Lord, it seems in so many ways our culture is so upside down. And Lord, it starts right there in, 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 the, in the leadership of our nation. God, we pray for God-fearing leaders. Please give them, remove those who don't fear you, Lord, who don't revere you. And God, I also pray today that we as the church would be the salt and light you call us to be, Lord. Not be ashamed of speaking on what is right because you are the God who is righteous, Lord. And you are the one who establishes the righteous standard that's to be upheld in our culture. And Lord, may we speak for that. We're supposed to be seeking your kingdom and your righteousness. So Father, may we do that passionately, Lord, even in this process of choosing right officials. God, we pray for Lane and Tony, uh, for Mark and um, We ask, God, and for Bud, we ask your comfort for them, your strength, your healing. God, we pray that you supply every every need they have this morning. Others that, Lord, we may be mindful of as well. Lord, we intercede for them today. We, We intercede on their behalf and ask that you supply that grace and mercy to them. Lord, we gather to worship you. You're on your throne. We're kneeling before you here on the altar and in our hearts. God, may may we praise you today and magnify you. May our worship reflect those who have surrendered and yielded to your reign and rule. We love you and praise you and ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen and amen. Amen again. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning as we gather in worship. If you're visiting today, we're especially grateful to have you here in the sanctuary. If you're watching online or listening on the radio as well. We're going to ask you if you're in the sanctuary this morning just to remain seated for a moment if it's your first time with us so that our church family can welcome you into the house of the Lord. We do it real simply. South River family, you stand, greet one another in the name of the Lord. If you see a guest seated around you, go introduce yourself and make them feel welcome at this time. All right, folks, let's gather back together. Thank you for taking some time to fellowship with one another. And guess you can stand with us as we continue to worship. Worship, a heart of worship says, yes, I will, Lord. 
I will praise you. I will live obedient to, obediently to you. That's what we bring in our hearts. Let's continue to worship him this morning. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. What the trial I'm going through. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all with our mouth today that we will continue to praise you not just with our voices with our hands with everything that we have and we are but Lord we will praise you and worship you every day with our lives you have bought us with a price and God you are the only one in whom we find hope Jesus is the only one who gives life and redemption and so, Lord, you are the only one worth worshiping and living rightly for. But thank God we don't do it by ourselves. Your Spirit indwells us and empowers us. Lord, thank you that we have a friend in Jesus. And we give today to glorify that friend, that one who has called us and he walks with us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated.
Choir. Praise the Lord. Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen. He's always there for you and for me. Children, you're dismissed with Brother Timothy to Children's Church. So you grab your Bibles and head on out to study God's Word there. And if you have your copy of God's Word this morning, I encourage you to grab it and turn with me over to that little epistle to the Philippians that Paul wrote. And as he was in prison writing to them. And I want you to join with me turning to Philippians chapter to this morning. Follow along with me. In just a moment, we'll stand and read just four verses. But uh, as we're turning there, we're turning and hearing God speak to us about living godly lives. And as we're studying the doctrine of godliness, we're going to finish today uh, a portion of that study on what motivates us to live godly. And starting next week, we'll be looking at different spiritual disciplines that should be evident in your life and my life as disciples of Christ. But, you know, these past two weeks, I don't know about you, as I said in the prayer earlier, I've been encouraged to see God's people working together, churches coming together and ministering uh, to those who are hurting and those who need help, stepping up and ministering, supplying resources and, and, and just helping people bring order back to their life. I praise God that we worship a God who makes things new. Amen. And making things new is what the gospel really is all about, that you and I, can be made new. We can be made new and have a new hope, a new help. And to know that we can share that with others around us. It's been a great encouragement uh, to see that happen. Not just the body of believers. Listen, if even when they can't go, just supporting and holding the ropes, as we say, for those who are going. And so that's been a great... There's hope for America, so you know, when you see things like that. Amen? And it's not just the government that's going to fix things. We realize that quickly. But it's God's people. Listen, it's the gospel that's going to make things new. Well, we're opening up this little epistle this morning and looking at these four little verses in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And what's important to understand is in the Greek, this is just one sentence. It's one long sentence, a really long sentence in the Greek. Uh, but for us, it's four verses. And Paul just, he has a thought and he, he speaks on it. And then he runs into another thought and he speaks on that. And so as we hear this, you have to hear the apostle who's speaking to us. And, and it follows on the heel of what he said in, at the end of chapter 1. If you'll uh, note there in just a moment, verse 27, he's talking about living a life that your conduct, my conduct, living worthy of the gospel. That my life, your life should demonstrate to the world around us the power of the gospel by the way we treat others, the way we deal with others. Isn't that what the gospel is all about? God, listen, Jesus, 
didn't hold on to his position, but emptied himself and took not only the form of humanity, but the form of a servant. Why? To serve others. Jesus himself saying, I did not come to be served, but to serve others, right? And he came to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Paul, and he's speaking in this whole epistle, he's saying, listen, church, we need to be one. We need to be together for the gospel, to share good news. That's why we're here. Realize, if you have life and breath this morning, you and I are still here to bring help and hope to those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's why we're still not in his presence. We're still here on this earth. And Paul is saying, listen, understand this. The gospel's not chained in any way. I'm chained, I'm in prison, I'm writing to you, and I'm telling you, you're not chained, and you should work together for the gospel. And this is a prime opportunity for the church, really, to do that as people, listen, who have lost a lot, are, are looking for answers right now, and we have them in the gospel, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul's speaking to the church in his day. Listen, I don't know about you, but the church needs to be one like never before. I mean, he's going to emphasize that in the section preceding this, what we're going to read. He says, listen, we need to realize that the church needs to be one, firmly united, because there are those on the outside that oppose the church. Do you realize that today? That there are those who oppose the church, stand diametrically opposed to everything you and I believe. Particularly what we believe about this book and the precepts and principles that God has given us. There are those who despise it, don't have anything to do with it, fight against it, don't want you and I to say anything about what God says. Would love to silence us and not allow us to be a voice in this culture. They're on the outside and Paul is warning against that. And the need for the church to be unified in light of that. But in this section, it's not so much those on the outside that he's talking about. But he's talking about those really on the inside looking at one another and realizing, listen, we need to be locked in together. We need to be unified He'll address it over in chapter 4 with two ladies that were having a little squabble. And, and their differences were causing division and strife in the church. And he said, that can't be. We can't allow that to happen. We need to be unified as one. And there's a mindset that we possess when we're pursuing that unity. That expression of oneness. By the way, by the way, isn't that our confession? Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. The three in one, we, we want to manifest that oneness, that unity, because it's a reflection of the God that we declare that we worship. And so Paul is speaking to the church about unity, about oneness, living a life, uh, walking in godliness, worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ that saved us, and demonstrating that to a world around this. And I need to have, you need to have this mindset that he speaks of, in that pursuit of unity and that pursuit of oneness. And we need to realize there's a world that's hostile to everything that we believe this morning. So I want you to stand with me in honor of the word of the Lord this morning. And so that we can stand and, and read how to live godly lives because of the gospel. And we do that by putting others first, which is what the gospel is all about. Remember, down in chapter 2, now notice there's a therefore right there. And it's therefore verses 27 through 30, the end of chapter 1, which said in verse 21, I underlined it in my Bible, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And, and he speaks about unity there because of the outside problems, but we're talking about us inside this room, we inside this room, how shall we be? Notice what he says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, for ifs, which you could read as since or because, fulfill my joy, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Father, may we be a community that possesses this mindset, Lord. That, Father, we're not 
like this world, out to get what's for me, what I need, but God, what others need around me, particularly here within the walls of this church. God, Father, may our testimony be that we are a community of faith that, Lord, understands what Christ did for us, Lord, and what the gospel has done for us when your son looked out for our best interest and put us before himself and laid himself down to die for us. God, may we embrace that opportunity, that mindset. And Father, may we speak the gospel, not just in words, but by our actions and by our oneness, Lord, as we do this. We love you today. Speak to our hearts and let our minds be transformed and renewed. And Lord, may we live lives that please and glorify you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Paul is developing a critical idea. Listen, genuine love and genuine unity is possible only when there's true humility. You and I can possess or experience God's genuine love. We can be pursuing a, a unity between one another, but that'll only happen when we have humility, humbleness in our hearts and putting others First, and Paul is writing again, as I said, therefore, in chapter 2, uh, you can circle the therefore and draw a little line all the way back up to verse 27 because he said, this was his argument, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Because of the gospel, it may be the case in verse 29 that not only do we, are we blessed by the gospel, becoming God's children and becoming part of the family of faith, we also may suffer for the gospel as he was, as he wrote this epistle, saying over in chapter 1, I'm chained. I, I'm, 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 in, I'm in prison because of the gospel, but the gospel's not chained. Praise the Lord. And because of what I'm experiencing, you may experience it as well. Realize that we need to be one. Now, there's a reason why we need to be one and we need to be motivated towards that. And he has it with these four little ifs that we read. And hopefully you circle those. They're not ifs that express doubt. Like, well, I wonder if that'll happen. I don't know if it'll happen. He's really in the Greek. It's a conditional clause. And you could almost write since or because. The, the, the meaning of the Greek there is, listen, it, 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 if such and such is true, and I know it is true, then... Right? So let me ask you a question this morning. Is this true for you? Have you any consolation in Christ? Jesus, when he was born, he was the consolation of Israel. What does that mean? Well, those who were in desperation wanted deliverance. And they were looking for deliverance. Have you found deliverance in Jesus? Is that true for you and me this morning? Since we have experienced that consolation, since we have experienced the one who has paid the penalty for our sins, since we have experienced the one who has freed us from the guilt of our sins, since we have now an inheritance to look forward to, is that true for us this morning? I would love a hearty amen somewhere in there. Amen? If that's true, since that's true, since we've experienced that consolation in Christ, and since we have experienced the comfort of love, not just listen, it's awesome to stop and think about God's love demonstrated at Calvary. Listen, where Christ died for you and me, gave himself for you and me, paid the penalty for our sins on that cross. Since he did that, do you believe he did that for you? That he loved you and died for you? You've passed through the waters of baptism, declaring your faith in Christ, that he died on that cross, he was buried and rose again, and he died for you. Not just for the whole world, but he died for me. He loved me. He died in my place. He paid the penalty I deserved. He demonstrated his life, laying his life down for me. Is that true for you since that is true for you? And, and since you have fellowship of the Spirit, since now, listen, Christ returned. He went back to, to heaven and he, he gave his spirit. The spirit came. And, and when you and I put our faith and trust in Christ, the spirit of God comes in into us now and, and seals us and secures us. And he empowers us to live godly lives. And, and, and he gifts us to, to do the ministry that, that God calls us to do. If that's not wondering, 
well, maybe that's happened. I don't know. No, no, no. Since that's happened in my life, since the Spirit of God dwells within me, do I know that today, that I've experienced God's love? I've been consoled because of what Christ has done. And now I've experienced the koinonia, the fellowship, the oneness, the unity of the Spirit of God. Is that true for us today as the church? Have we experienced that? And and if any affection and any mercy, do you realize today we once were alienated from God? We were far from Him, right? And yet God brought us near. We once weren't in His family. We were enemies of God. And yet now Christ has reconciled us and we've experienced the mercy of God. And we who were far have been brought near. It's not, well, I don't know if that's happened in my life. I don't know if I was far from God and I'm near. No, 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 no. Since that has happened, because we have experienced all of these things, his affection, his, his mercy, the mercy of God. I mean, just stop and think about what Paul would say over to the Ephesians. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were children of doom, children of darkness. But the mercy of God came to us. Praise God this morning. Is that true if we've experienced any of those things since we've experienced those things? Therefore, since those things are a reality for us, they're not a wonder, well, maybe. No, 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 no. They are true. I can point back to the day where I experienced these things. And that love of God that, that was shown at Calvary is something now that, that I experience each and every day, knowing nothing's going to separate me from that affection and love of God each and every day. Do I know that? Do you know that this morning? It's Paul saying, since you've experienced that, because you've experienced that, you and I should, there should be something that flows out of our lives if these things are true. And what should be evident in our life? We should be pursuing oneness for the sake of the gospel. We should be pursuing unity for the sake of the gospel. And if you're pursuing unity for the oneness for the sake of the gospel, then you're willing to pursue laying down your life just as your Savior did for you. He's saying this is what the church should look like as those who have experienced these things. And the amazing thing is, well, we've got every reason to sing and shout and motivation to want to walk and live with conduct that is worthy of this good news. My life should demonstrate that day in and day out, not just outside of these walls, but within these walls, because these things are true. Our duty flows because of what Christ has done for us and because of the Spirit of God who dwells within us. And if I profess this with my lips, and this is my testimony to a world around us, then it should be evident by what is a priority in my life. And Paul says that's getting the gospel, spreading the gospel, sharing the gospel, making good news known to those around us. Therefore, if any of these things happen, now here's the imperative, verse 2. Fulfill my joy. That's the imperative in the Greek. This is the command in the Greek. Paul says, I want to have a spell. I want to rejoice. I want my joy to be full. There's no greater joy than when you witness and see God's people who've experienced these things coming together as one and impacting the world around them. Hopefully, you've seen that around you these past two weeks. If you've been up in the mountains on some of these teams going or seen some of the videos and you see brothers and sisters coming together, sometimes in different churches working together, it's amazing the testimony that that brings to a world whose life is upside down right now. And that encourages me and it should encourage you as well. But it doesn't stop there. It's supposed to be how we conduct ourselves. That's just the flow of who we are. Because you know what? God's love doesn't ebb and flow. It's always the same. He never loves us more. He never loves us less. He just loves us. We don't get fullness of the... Listen, we get all the Spirit all the time. He's all there. It's not like, well, we got Him today. We don't have Him tomorrow. Oh, no, no. God's affection, God's mercies, they're new every morning. God's not going to change in any of these ways. We shouldn't either. We should be consistent in this. 
And Paul says, listen, I want my joy to be filled as I see and experience and hear the testimony of who you are and what you've done because of the power of the gospel. And if you've experienced this, then what should flow from it immediately is unity, a oneness, a harmony, a, a unity uh, that, uh, of the whole body. Now notice this. I underline this in my Bible in verse 2 because it's repeated three times, four times. He, he says this word which highlights oneness. Notice this. Therefore, fulfill my joy, verse 2, imperative, by what? Being like-minded. That means being one, having one mind, or having the same love, or being of one accord, or of one mind. You notice there, one, one, same, like, all those things have the idea of harmony, of, of unity, of being one. And that should be our testimony to the world around us because we confess that the God that we worship is three in one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all work together in all that they've done, creating this world, redeeming this world, sustaining this world, and one day being glorifying all those who have put their faith and trust in the one true God. And we, as his family, as people who now become part of that family, we should demonstrate that oneness by expressing and sharing, listen, sharing the same mind, being about the same purposes, and sharing the same love that we all have experienced. We have a common confession that we share about our God, that he is one. Paul would emphasize that over in Ephesians chapter 4, that there is one faith and one God, one baptism, one Lord. We've experienced and expressed all of that to be true. But we have more than just doctrine that binds us together. One spirit fills all of us. One son died for all of us. One father reigns and rules over all of us. So I should have a passion in my heart, if that's my profession of faith, that I am going to at all costs pursue oneness. And beloved, when we're pursuing oneness, man, I'm telling you the joy just flows. There's joy that, that fills our hearts and joy that other people express and experience. And he says it starts with what you think. It starts with our minds. We have to be like-minded. We have to share the same minds. Listen, are you just like inclined when you're thinking process to say, listen, I'm going to see how I can disagree with whatever the current opinion is. Because there's some who have that unspiritual gift. Amen? Right? They do. It's like, I'm just going to look for something to, to, to pick at right here. Rather than finding all the areas of commonality where we can think about the same thing and maybe work on those other things, no, we're going to start with where we disagree as the point of contention. That's not going to help in spreading and sharing the gospel. But having the same mind, being like-minded. Well, I wonder whose mind we should have. Well, he's going to emphasize that down in verse 5. If you want to draw a little circle and a line down there. What mind is it that we should have? Well, he's going to say, listen, have this mind in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, though he existed in the form of God, he didn't hold on to that position. But he emptied himself and took on flesh. Humanity. Specifically, that of a bondservant, a doulos. He, he, he came and put that mindset on. A willingness to serve others and do the will of his father. What did Jesus come to do? He came to, to give his life as a ransom for many, but he came to do the will of his father. He came to serve his father. Whatever his father said to do, he willingly, joyfully came to do. And that's the mindset that we should have. Now listen, if I'm thinking that way, if I'm thinking about being like Christ and having that mindset guide and direct my steps, then what's going to flow out of that is I'm going to have the same love. Because when Christ did that, that was the expression of God's love. That was the demonstration of God's love for you and me. Now listen, Though we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God. That is how God demonstrated how much he loved every single one of us in this room. When he put us, listen, and our needs as desperate sinners there as something that had to be reconciled to him. He did something about it. Praise God this morning. 
That's why hopefully you're sitting in the pew this morning or watching online or listening on the radio. Listen, it's because I've experienced the love of Christ. If I've got that mind of God in my mind, then I'm also going to be pursuing that same kind of love, that love for others around me. That will be what pours out of my heart. It will involve, listen, being of one accord. Literally in the Greek, the idea is that our souls will be joined together as one. Now listen, you've heard this phrase before. Uh, I know some people, they've been married a long time, and they say, well, that he or she's my soul mate. You've heard that before? You know, and they pretty much, everything, you know, you, 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 you learn as you walk together, you grow together, you start thinking the same things, and, and, and you're like, wow, that's exactly what I was thinking, right? Well, that's exactly what I wanted. I mean, that happens. That's the picture of the body of Christ that we're supposed to demonstrate. One, one mind, one love we've experienced, one soul all linked together. And, and it just makes sense because we have one spirit within us who's guiding us in that. Directing us in the steps of, that we're to take as the family of faith, as the people of God. Paul says, listen, that's what we should, we should desire, being all of this of one mind at all costs. Now, when we do that, if we've experienced all those things, and because we have experienced all things, that it's a reality for us. And, and, and now that because we are pursuing that oneness, how do we do that? He says it in verse 3 and 4. Let nothing that we do, nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but instead in lowliness of mind, let each, I underline this in my Bible, esteem others better than himself. Let each one look out, not for their own interests, but also for the interests of others. This would radically change church life today. I'm telling you, there's so many. Man, I get an email at 5 in the morning. Somebody, well, I'm, we're moving our church membership. Well, that'll just bless your soul on a Sunday morning. I'll just tell you as a preacher, okay? I can't believe it. Listen. Why? Well, oftentimes what happens is people go, well, what's this church got for me? What's this church got for me? That's not the mind of Christ. That's, not the, that's the mind of materialistic, hedonistic culture that we live in. What do I get out of it? That's the fleshly, carnal nature that we have. The mind of Christ is this. It's not about me. It's about others, putting others before myself. If I'm exalting myself, lifting myself up, I'm not going to be thinking about others because all I'm thinking about is number one. Hello? You see, that's the whole contrast, isn't it? It's either number one right here or number one up there. Amen? Who's number one? Well, if we've confessed this and experienced this and, and have experience his love and the fellowship of his spirit and we have this common confession that we now share and it just makes sense he's what it's all about his agenda not mine what he says is important not me and this is what paul is saying listen if this is the case let nothing be done for own ambition or because of conceit that's of the devil pride conceit that's what brought things down. We want to humbly bend the knee and get lower like our Savior and be like a servant who takes up the towel. It's not about Him. It's about others and what I can do to minister to them. This is the attitude that we should possess as believers. This is the attitude that is worthy of the gospel because it is the gospel. It's what Christ did for you and for me. It's what he demonstrated for us by the way he lived and the way he walked upon this earth and the way he died at Calvary for you and for me. If I'm thinking about number one, uno, numero uno right here, I'm not going to think about others. I'm going to be thinking about all of my needs and what I'm, I'm aware of all of my needs. But let me tell you something. If I don't focus on myself but focus on others, if I make much of them, if I keep my eyes on it, I'm telling you, the reason why people are so, people have no satisfaction in life today 
is because they're looking out for number one and they're never finding satisfaction because there's always a greater need. There's always more. But if they're looking out for that number one, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit who are one, He promises to supply everything we have need of. He promises to satisfy the hunger of our souls. And when I make that a priority in my life, man, I'm telling you, this will radically change the way you and I lead our homes. Ladies, this will radically change the way you nurture in the home. Students, listen, this will radically change your expectation of your parents based on what your peers say they should or shouldn't be doing. Why? Because we're guided by these principles and these precepts which help us to realize, listen, it's not about me. This world, I'm telling you, we're all born into it. If you need evidence, go work in the nursery on a Sunday morning. Listen, these little ones, and they're precious. There's one back there, a little precious thing with a little bow on her head. I'm telling you. But I'm telling you, they are born and they are the center of their world until we help them to realize, no, they're not. He is. God is. And you need to learn to orient your life that way. You look around you at the culture around you. It's all about me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. That's what it's about. No, it's not about you and me. It's about Him. And He wants to work in our lives and through our lives to share and show the world around Him that they were on His mind. That's why He was willing to die on that cross and pay the penalty for their sins even when they reject Him. Even when they raise their fist and stand in rebellion against him, he willingly did that. Dying on that cross for the men who were pounding the nails in his hand. Stop and think about that. Thinking about that as he raised him up and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Wow. What amazing love. That he would demonstrate that for this world. You see, this mindset that we're to have, this Thinking of others and putting others before ourselves and looking out for their interests. It is what Christ has done and demonstrated for us. We grow in this humility as we reflect on the humble one, the humble servant who came and gave himself for us. And that's what Paul would then explain. Listen, not just in the example of Christ from verse 5 through 11, but then he puts other illustrations before you all throughout this chapter. He talks about Timothy and Epaphroditus. A servants, listen, you say, Pastor, I don't know if I can be like, do it like Jesus. Well, Timothy did it, and, and Epaphroditus did it. And, and it's a willingness to die to self and find life in Christ. And we grow in that humility that's willing to serve others by wanting, listen, I don't have to take notice of myself. I, I, I'm telling you, this Facebook stuff, I tell you, man, everybody wants you to just promote self and put that out there. Like a billboard, or, you know what I'm saying? Be careful. It's a narcissistic culture that's just built on self. Don't feed that in your carnal flesh. Realize that. And even the church can get caught up in that. No, no, no. I, don't, I, don't, I just want God to know what I'm doing. Amen? Because then my reward is up there. That's where it needs to be stored up. If I've got to parade that and put that forward. Christ didn't do that, man. He took the form of a bondservant. He took up a towel. Everybody was arguing about who's going to wash each other's feet. Jesus went and washed their feet. Am I willing to embrace that by putting other needs before my own? I'm telling you, I'm excited as a pastor when I see our church family growing in humility by serving others, growing in humility by following the example of Christ, growing in humility when we're cultivating that spirit of humility by seeking opportunities, not waiting to be served, but finding opportunities to serve others. And what we display is the power of the gospel to the world around us. Remember, what did Jesus say? You want to be great in my kingdom? Listen, who's the greatest one? They argued about it, the disciples. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Those who serve others. And that's the mindset. You have to put others before you, before you realize, I need to serve them. Do I embrace, listen, do I embrace that opportunity when I come to worship at church? Do I embrace this opportunity? Listen, I wonder what somebody's going to do for me or what I can do for someone else. This radically flips our lives, radically, when we embrace that opportunity. And what we need to do is to have the courage to serve, listen, to have this mindset that's willing to serve one another and put others before us and demonstrate the compassion of Christ 
that we've experienced. And praise God, beloved, I pray you've experienced that. And the amazing thing is God wants you to experience that. It's why he died for you and for me. It's why he gave himself for us to change us, to give us new life. And what we want to see is God work in me that gospel. Let the power of it be displayed because people see my life changed. People should ask us, man, why are you doing that? What has this changed about you? You're not asking about for yourself. It's about others. That should be a witness. And, that we, and in that, that's the witness opportunity that God gives us to say, well, let me tell you. Listen, my life for yours, I serve you. Why? Because let me tell you about one who served me. And let me tell you about what he did. You see, he didn't hold on to heaven. He could have. He could have sat on his throne, but he didn't. No, 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 no. He willingly, he voluntarily stepped down into this earth to redeem it. To offer himself, listen, vicariously, to put, be put in our place to pay the penalty for our sins. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. But he showed it. And victoriously, he rose again. And he has assured us that when I embrace that mindset, and I embrace that lifestyle, and I put others before me, myself, that there is victory and joy. And my God, my Savior, your God, your Savior, Jesus, he demonstrates that. And he calls us, church, to do that today. I want to invite you to bow your heads this morning with me and ask the Lord, is it true in my life? See, only you and God know your hearts. Is it true this morning that I've experienced the, the love of God, the consolation of Christ, the, the fellowship of His Spirit, His affection and His mercy? And if that's true, is it true that I'm pursuing unity and I'm pursuing humility? Because if it's not, beloved, it can be changed today. And perhaps it's the case that you need to acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. A testimony of what Christ has done for, for you. And you want to make that profession known publicly. We invite you to do that at this time. Or perhaps if you're attached to Jesus, He's your Lord and Savior. But you're not attached to a local body of believers. And you believe God's led you here to South River Baptist Church to lock arms with us. We invite you at this time to come and say, listen, I believe God's leading me to this church family to be a part of this church family. And and together with brothers and sisters to go and share and show the love of God to the world around us. Or maybe you just want to get on the altar and pray for God to continue to give us that mindset of willingness to serve others and put others before ourselves. Maybe we need to repent. God, I've been all about me. What's in it for me? What do I get out of it? And I should be thinking of others. Forgive me. There's grace.